I'm Sam Fleming, I'm the team captain of Army of Darkness, and I am the wildcard editor at Road Racing World. And this here is a 2020 Yamaha R1, and we used this bike to win the Weira Endurance Championship in 2020, uh, and then we used it as a practice bike in 2021, and we used it as a practice bike in 2022, and uh, it is now starting to jump out of gear in third gear. So it has 4,000 miles on it, which is about a 33% improvement in engine life over our 2008 R1s that we used to campaign. Um, those lasted around 3,000 miles before various engine parts would start uh, falling apart on them. Um, and what we found then was uh, when we started losing one part, like the transmission or something, um, pretty much everything was at end of life and we had to change it all out. So, and the kit transmissions for these are a forged transmission. Um, this one's still got the centered uh, stock transmission in it. And we are going to pull the engine out and we're going to take it down to KWS and see what else is worn out in it. Um, for next year, for our 2023 engine, we're just going to change everything. So we're going to put in new valves and new pistons and new bearings and new clutch plates. And actually, you know, we're just replacing everything no matter what. Um, but I'm really interested to see uh, when we measure it, if we can see, um, you know, if the valves are uh, starting to go out of spec or anything like that. Because I just think it'll be kind of interesting to see that. Um, yeah. I'm going to get the rest of the crew down here. We're going to pull the engine out of this one. Uh, and uh, drive down to KWS. Uh, hey, I'm Mike Godin. Uh, we're here at KWS Motorsports. Uh, today we're here taking apart the Army of Darkness uh, endurance motor to see uh, how, uh, how it fared after a full season and a lot of miles on it and uh, what we can do for next year. We uh, got the covers and stuff off. We're just doing like a quick visual inspection on the outside. Now I'm going to start doing, uh, as I do a disassembly, we're going to look at valve lash, leak down, which is how well the cylinder holds pressure. Let's like the, the cheater first. way in a dealership is you have your loosest one and your tightest one, like your feeler gauges. Mm -hmm. so it's oh, like, you just, yeah. If this goes in and this doesn't, you're in the range, you're done. You don't actually find the number. Yeah. <sighs> Is that cheating, really? <laughs> no, it's just being efficient when, yeah, you, exactly. when you work on flat rate. Right. All right, so in the olden days, people always talked about compression testers. And then about 30 years ago, we all moved to leak down testers. Yeah. And why do we love leak down testers so much? Because they work better. Compression just tells you what the thing's doing when it's spinning, but it doesn't really tell you how well it seals or where, where a leak is potentially coming from. With leak down, you can pinpoint whether it's an exhaust, through the rings, an intake, or God forbid you have some other major thing going on in there. What would you consider a good um, leak down number for? Uh... Um, on a street engine, anything less than 10%. What we're doing, I'd like to see uh, four or less. And that's, and then like this thing's been sitting, it's cold. You know, you could throw some oil in there and you're going to see it go up. It just kind of depends where it's coming from. It could just be because it's dry and it's been sitting for, you know, a month and a half. But if you were to run it and then check it again, you'll probably see it go up just from getting some oil circulated into the rings and stuff. So uh, this is the intake and then exhaust uh, valve clearance or valve lash. We're just kind of seeing where... Um, where the valves ended up, if they if they wore at all, or we lost or gained any clearance uh, from something mechanical happening. This is leak down. This is how well the cylinder holds uh, a set amount of pressure uh, when we when it's applied. That tells you if you if if it was bad, that would tell you if you have a ring or a piston seal that isn't good, or you have uh, excessive air coming through into intake or an exhaust valves which would be an indication of bad valve, bad valve seats, uh, excess carbon or something in the in the uh, chamber. And we're not seeing anything with this one? Not at all. This is, a, if it was a street engine, this thing's perfect, running great. Uh, the fact that you've gone through a whole season of endurance racing on just regular fuel, this is this thing's running great. If, uh, if it weren't for maybe some other problems and this was just some club guy, he'd, he'd be good for probably another year or two. <laughs> Because it's a cross-plane crank, 
you don't just have two cylinders up, two cylinders down. So when you load, when you load the cams on that kind of motor, they're all even. So two are going to be open, two are going to be closed. This thing, if you don't put the cam in in the right spot, if you really don't know what you're doing, you can break a cam in half because you're loading all the cam lobes at once with a lot of pressure and trying to bolt all the cam caps down. When you install this thing and time it based on the factory settings, they want all the lobes unloaded. So you don't do it at top dead center. You do it at like 105 degrees uh, before top dead center. And then it goes together nice and cleanly. <laughs> Moved to Oklahoma. Um, the, the chef that I first uh, learned under had a bike, uh, an 86 Gixxer 1100. Okay. First first year, that's when I started watching GPs and doing all this stuff. And like he kind of showed me a lot of stuff. I got a bike. And of course I bought an old race bike that was on the street. So um, those motors were prone to bad valves. So like I worked on my own stuff because I didn't have any money because I was working on an old race bike that was beat to crap. Right. So... <laughs> A tail as, as old as the yeah. sport itself. Yeah. So I started, you know, I was working on my engine in the parking lot and breaking cams and doing dumb stuff. Was, was it also a 6 or 1100 or what was that one? No, I, that was the FZR 600. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Right. The receding valve wonder. Yeah. <laughs> Be, if, but before I knew that. So yeah, I'm yeah. like, oh, it's the coils or it's this. Yeah, and yeah. like, I, oh, yeah. a lot of growing pains. Um, the best thing about those though, would they would just keep mushrooming and sinking into the head, but they wouldn't break. No. Right? The new ones, it's like... Nope. That thing, it, like, it, it like, was they just funny, break. like, if I held a rope and I was on the bike, I could get towed and get it running. Yeah, yeah. It would stay running as long as it was hot. Yep. So, like, I'm gonna go to school to work on bikes. Like, I like, I like bikes. Didn't know that you weren't gonna make crap for money right, for the rest yeah. of your life. <laughs> so this is a rocker arm motor. This uh, allows you to, you have a, what, instead of like an egg-shaped lobe, you have an oblong lobe. Let me grab this can here. And you kind of see that there's an asymmetrical shape. But that's because when it's rotating, it's rot rotating on a rocker arm. That rocker arm, when you have a cert, uh, it doesn't ride directly over the cam, so you actually can get more lift than the cam because it's working like a teeter-totter. It has leverage. So it's pushing on the, usually right in here, but the end of the valve is getting pushed on at the end of the rocker, so it gets amplified. So there's a ratio to it. Um, it's asymmetrical because it, as it rotates, it's on one side of this little pad as it's opening, but it's on a different side of the pad. So when you actually graph it out, it's still a very symmetrical shape. It just looks asymmetric. It's just asymmetrical from the activation because of the the position that it is actually riding on the on the pad of the rocker a lot of your motors are doing this now because this is a much lighter setup than having a bucket on top of it um, the the these rocker arms extremely light five to seven grams versus a bucket which weighs more but because this pivots you're not moving the whole rocker so you're only moving half the weight of a bucket which allows you to spin it to a higher RPM and also have, uh, get more lift and stuff out of it without having as much mass being moved. 